Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Amen. Yeah, the, the sun's shining brightly through each one of you. It's so good for us to be able to gather together and to worship the Lord uh, as one. I want to welcome those who might be visiting us today. We are glad uh, to have your attendance with us and uh, appreciate you being our guest. Um, if you are visiting and would like the church to contact you, please notice that a portion of the bulletin um, can be uh, torn out. You can write your information there. And following the service, uh, you can put that in any of the offering plates um, in the sanctuary, and uh, we will contact you this coming week. I would like to also say a word of welcome to those who are joining us online. Uh, we uh, welcome your presence in this time of worship, and I uh, hope that this will be a meaningful time for you as well. Um, as I do each week, I'd like to invite you to say hello in the comment section so we can have an idea of the community um, that is gathered with us online. This morning, for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so uh, by placing them in the offering plates that are located on the sides of the stage, also in the vestibule following the service. Um, additionally, you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org. There's a link at the, at the top of the page, and you can drop off and mail um, tithes and offerings to the office during the week. This morning we have a few announcements. The first is that uh, the Senior Adult Valentine Banquet is following worship today. And so um, that will uh, be directly following worship in the fellowship hall. And um, look forward to, uh, to that time of fellowship. And I uh, thank our youth and their parents and um, other volunteers for the work they have already done um, for this banquet. Uh, the Youth Super Bowl party is this evening at 6 p.m., Youth, make sure y'all bring something to share, all right? And don't everybody bring the same thing, right? Because you got to have a smorgasbord, right? Y'all are just going to stare at me like that the whole time? All right. It's going to be a fun time. Um, I want to make sure this is on your calendar. There's some other things in the, in the announcements here, but want to make sure that you know about this. Uh, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday is, is Ash Wednesday, and we will be having an Ash Wednesday service here at our church. And so I know it's been a few years since we have done uh, one just for First Baptist Church um, here. Um, so uh, please put that on your calendar. It will be a very special time um, as we begin uh, the season of Lent and journey through together. And uh, uh, again, that will be on the 22nd, uh, Wednesday the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. At this time, um, I would like to invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer as we seek the Lord together. Father God, we are so thankful for your presence with us always. God, as we gather to worship you this morning, we thank you for the ways that you are here, uh, the ways you have been leading us and, and, uh, and bringing us together. And we pray that this time would be a, a time of celebrating you, of worshiping you, of giving you all the things you deserve, and that we would find that uh, as we do that, that you fill us up, that uh, you give us joy and happiness because we were created to worship you, Lord. And so uh, we give you thanks for this time, we pray that you would continue to guide us and direct us and help us to be uh, the body of Christ that we are called to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This morning I will be reading um, from Psalm 112, 1 through 9. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. God, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear or bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look and triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Worship, tremble. As we have a time of prayer this morning, I want to direct your attention to the prayer list that is printed inside of our, on the back side of our bulletin. And I'd like to encourage you to uh, take a minute or two um, during a time of silence before I begin the pastoral prayer to lift up uh, members of our church and 
uh, family members of members and friends of members, people who are going through various things. It's also a time for us to pray for those who may not uh, be listed on our prayer list. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of our hearts, you hear our prayers, you hear our pleas. God, as we come before you this morning and and bring uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ to you and ask that you continue working in their lives, we pray uh, that we will see uh, the answers to those prayers. God, we thank you for these um, who we lift up to you, for Jackie, for Betty, Ralph, Alec, Kathy, Randy, Jeff, Bobby, Michael, uh, the family of Joe Lewis, Van and Diane, Brenda, Dale, Missy, Donald, Randy, Lynn, Abby, Henry, Edith, Brian. And there are so many other names that we also carry in our hearts and bring to you this morning. Again, people that we lift up to you, people who you've created in your image and you've gifted and you've blessed. Um, Lord, we all go through trials in life, through difficult times. Uh, We are all in need of physical healing um, at some points in our lives. And while we have uh, the promises that you've given us uh, of an eternity with you that is absent of pain and mourning and and death, um, God, we do cling to and long for the lives that we get to live here on this earth, to live with purpose, to live offering love and grace to others. And so, God, we pray for these uh, this morning. We pray that you would um, bring healing. We pray that you would continue to perform miracles. And, God, that we would see those things and that you would continue to bring purpose into people's lives um, and, and give, uh, you know, give us uh, the desires that we have that are pleasing to you. Um, God, we thank you for the purpose of our church and for the calling that you've given us to make disciples of Jesus and to to live within relationship with one another and um, to encourage one another. And we just pray that we would continue to experience blessing as you lead us and guide us and direct us. We pray that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and the leading of your Holy Spirit, that um, that we we would hear you when you call us, have... Uh, courage to step into the places where you call us to be your hands and feet and your voice when it's needed. So uh, we give you thanks again for hearing our prayers. We give you thanks in advance for the ways that you're going to work in those lives of the people we've mentioned and lifted up to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand again as we sing uh, another song of worship here again.
morning. This morning's gospel reading comes from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as it's worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Not one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the righteous law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Praise his holy name. If I can ask all the kids to come down. Good morning. How are you? Are you sure? Are you really good? You look kind of sleepy. You still sleepy? No, you're good. How are you? Good. Do you remember what I just read? Were you listening? At least he says no. I'm good. (laughs) Okay, the first line that I read said, you are the salt of the earth. So what do you think I have? You think I have salt? Stick your finger in there. Now put it, get some on your finger. Now taste it. Oops, sorry. Taste it. What did you think? I hear Billy laughing, so I must have missed something over here. Did he make a face? (laughs) It's very, very salty when it's straight salt, right? But say you put it on some food that's very bland. It gives, huh? Yes, popcorn. What is like unsalted popcorn? That's not the best, is it? You want salt on your popcorn. Salt makes your food taste better. It gives it flavor. And just like we were talking about, I was reading in our passage, we are the salt of the earth. What do you think that means? Any idea? (laughs) They're still licking salt. Um, Being the salt of the earth for God. We are God's salt in a way. We have to help enrich people's lives. How do you think we do that? And enrich means make people's lives better. How do we make people's lives better? If I sit there and start poking you, is that making your life better? If I'm being mean, is that making lives better? No, of course not. We want to be good. We want to be nice and kind and loving to people. But most of all, we want to tell people about who? God. We want to tell people about God and his son and all they've done for us. And by telling them, we're experiencing how we're spreading our flavor and giving them salt and we're being the salt of the earth that we're called to be. So we have to tell people about God to help enrich their lives so they'll learn and hopefully do the same and share and bring God into their lives and make their lives better because God's in it. And that's how our lives are better is because God is in it. So remember this week, your challenge is to tell somebody about God. Help make their life better by spreading God's word. Okay, can you do that? you do that? All right, let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for the message that you've given us to spread. Help us to spread your word and your love throughout this earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Uh, as the choir is moving to sit with the congregation, I'd like to invite you to have a time of meeting and greeting uh, the folks that are around you. And when the music comes to an, a close, that's time, uh, a sign to get back to your seats. At one point during uh, Advent, we had a Sunday where uh, the children did not leave and they stayed in the, in the service. And so Luke asked me after the service, he said, Daddy, what was that right before you talked and did, the, did your sermon? I said, buddy, that's a little meet and greet time. He's like, do y'all do that every Sunday? And I said, yeah, we started doing it back in the fall and do it every Sunday. He said, I wish I could stay in there because I could run around everybody real fast. So... Uh, He's, uh, he's a little under the weather today, so he's not here. Um, I, don't, I don't have much of a hunting update that I can share today. Um, I can say that our squirrel tails bookmarks, I told you about that, right? They finally cured, and um, they're in the house now. And someone asked about that, you know, bringing those in. So I do, I do, Gina tells me I have to shampoo them before I can bring them in. So they smell like head and shoulders, and their volume and bounce is amazing. They look really good. Uh, and I was going to bring one for my Bible this morning, but I forgot it sh to show it to you. Um, but I, I'm so not much of a hunting update, but I have a golf update. Anybody want to hear my golf update? Yes. Okay, so I know there's, there's quite a few golfers here. And when, when I first came and was introduced to the congregation, y'all didn't have many questions. But one question that did come up was, are you a golfer? And the answer was no, I, I was not a golfer until uh, I've come here and y'all have taken me under your wing. And Luke keeps saying, why do the people keep dropping off golf stuff at the house? And I said, well, buddy, because they want me to be a golfer. And so I had a rite of passage moment this past week. Golf got me in trouble for the first time. And some, it was some bad, some bad trouble. Um, so, uh, so I saw, you know, Wednesday was a beautiful day. Amen? It was just, I mean, just so nice. I mean, it got, would it get close to 80, maybe o over 70? It was beautiful day, and so about 3.45, I said, I'm going to go out, uh, uh, Larry, Larry, uh, uh, Larry Lewis, Joyce, Joyce, where's Joyce at? There you go. You're usually on that, kind of on that side. You, you can't, you, you move on. So her husband, Larry, um, was here a couple weeks ago, and, uh, and we were talking about golf, and I told him, I said, I stopped taking my driver with me because I can't hit it straight, and he gave me some tips on it, so I said, I'm going to go out, 3.45, and hit, Gina had told me I need to pick up Luke from, you know, the afternoon. And I was thinking that was at aftercare. No, I was supposed to pick Luke up at four. All right. So the next thing I know, here comes some of the guys on the, uh, on the golf carts uh, rolling up trying to find me. Your wife's looking. Your, my, your wife. And I'm thinking someone died or something. I mean, something bad has happened. I mean, I was only out there for like 45 minutes. And, um, and then, y'all, I was in really, really big trouble. Like, really big trouble. Because I left Luke at school, and the assistant principal had to give him a ride to the Presbyterian Church. I know. It's, golf has got me in. Anyone have a worse one? You probably, some of you probably have worse golf stories. I hope that that's the worst one. But I, I was texting Jeffrey about this, and he was encouraging me. 
you know, we both love baseball. And in baseball, if you fail seven out of ten times, you're a really good hitter. If you've got a 300 average, right? We've got some baseball players up there. And so he, he texted me on Friday. He said, were you four for five for the week? And I said, yeah, I'm batting 800 for the week. But Gina said, that's not going to fly. That's not going to fly. But I got my first birdie when I was out there, and Larry's, Larry's tips worked. And um, anyway, hopefully golf didn't get me in trouble anymore. <sighs> Thanks, y'all. Thanks, y'all. All right, the current series that we are working through um, is the first few chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written by Paul to the church in Corinth, and he's writing to people that he spent quite a, 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 a long amount of time, you know, I, I think um, uh, 18 months is a good amount of time you're spending day in and day out with people planting a church. When you say in 18 months, you've probably imparted a lot of wisdom into people, helping this church become established, and he's moved on in his missionary journey, um, but he gets, as the Bible says, he gets a report from Chloe's people, Chloe's household. Chloe maybe writes him a letter, sends him a text message. I don't know how he gets it, but he finds out that there are some issues in the church. And we've been looking at 1 Corinthians and how Paul addresses some of these issues, but the first thing that Paul does and remember, I think it's important that we see this, and I've reminded you, I've preached on this the first week, reminded you the second and the third week. This is the fourth week into the series. I'm going to remind you again. The first thing that Paul does is that he reminds them of who they are in Christ Jesus. Okay? It took me a little while to remind Gina of all the good things that I had done, right, in the, in, you know, in being a father, all the times that I had picked Luke up, right? I, I, had, I had to remind her, you know, uh, there are some good things. You know, I did leave him at school one time, okay? And I know it was bad, you know, it, it was really embarrassing and such. Um, but what Paul does, he, he reminds them, he reminds them, he, he, even though he's going to roll up his sleeves and he's going to dive in and there are some major issues that they have, he's going to remind them of who they are in Christ Jesus. He reminds them, first of all, that when Jesus, uh, when God looks at them because of the blood of Jesus, he doesn't see them as sinners. God doesn't see them as sinners and the wages of sin is death. He doesn't see them as, as people who are on their way to hell. He sees them as saints. And it's important for us to understand that. Because there's going to be days we don't feel like saints, right? Aren't there days that you just say, you know what, I've, uh, life's been tough lately. And I haven't been a, doing a good job in response to the tough things in life. I don't feel much like a saint today. But theologically, our standing is as a saint, as one who is forgiven. Then he reminds them that they are all enriched in speech and wisdom. They have a lot of issues about bickering back and forth and divisions that have come up about who's the wisest, who's following you know, Paul, Apollos, uh, Peter, these different people who minister to them um, in, in the course of, uh, uh, of Paul's ministry with them. Some of them will attach themselves more to Peter, some more to Apollos, some to Paul, and then some rightly to Christ Jesus. And so uh, Paul reminds them, though, that they are all enriched because of the Holy Spirit. They are all gifted because of the Holy Spirit. They start fighting over their gifts. Well, I want the gift that that person has. They shine bright for Jesus. I don't feel like I shine as bright for Jesus. I talked to, you know, to us that day about um, the encouragement that we need to have to embrace who we are and how God has created us. Thank God that we are all different. That is by design. We, we each, none of us are exactly the same. Some of us may have some gifts that are in common, but that God uses them in different ways. And God uses the totality of the gifts that we have. And when I say the totality, there's not an age limit on that either. Youth, I want you to hear uh, this morning, and I'm, I'm glad that y'all are here uh, to, to be able to hear this, that you are integral and important to the life of our church. Let me talk to the person who's joining us online, and you feel like you can't get out and be part of of the body. Let me tell you that you do have an influence in the places where God has placed you. Even if you're not able to be here every Sunday or it's been a year or two since you have been. As I've told you, if you have air in your lungs, you have what? I heard someone whisper it. If you have air in your lungs, you got purpose. One day y'all are all going to say it at the same time. If you got air in your lungs, you got all right. There we go. We're moving now. He reminds them that they have purpose, that they've been gifted, that there is nothing in their lives um, that, that, that God can't take and can't use. He reminds them that they are sustained by the Holy Spirit, and they're going to be sustained in the journey that God has given them. They were waiting even then as we are waiting today for the return of Christ, and they were, they were just itching for it to happen. 
And Paul said, God will sustain you. The Spirit will sustain you. So that was all in week one. That must have been a long one. Randy, where you at? He didn't, he didn't tell me I had to get out early today because you can't play golf when it's raining, right? There you go. There you go. He asked me this morning, I, did State lose yesterday basketball? No, they did. They did get, they get, did they get whooped? Because he asked me, we won? Oh, so we can talk about it. We won, okay? I didn't know. He asked if it was too late to talk about it. I said, what? He said, State losing. So we won. All right, we'll talk about it. All right, so, um, all right, stay focused. We got, you got lunch. Some of y'all got lunch here afterwards, so, okay? Um, we'll be all right. All right, in week two, Paul brings this appeal. He, he, he rolls up his sleeves and he dives in. He, and he brings this appeal that they be perfectly united in mind and thought. Because guess what? The divisions were pulling them apart. I reminded us that day that our church has a purpose. And that our purpose is fivefold. That we are to worship the Lord together. When we step into this place, we don't step as individuals that each worship individually and we're kind of separate from, from one another. This is called corporate worship. Maybe you've never been told that before. I remember growing up in the church and my dad was a minister of music and no one ever explained until I was about 16 or 17 what exactly worship was and the importance of it and that we're coming into this space together to seek the Father together. And as we worship, it's important that, that, that our worship um, uh, uh, be reflective of the body. And I talked that day about our diversity in our worship and our blendedness in our worship. And then we have pieces that, you know, were 100 years old. And we have pieces that were three months old. And there, it all works together to help us all worship the Lord. So worship is important. Discipleship, following Jesus. We are called to be disciples of Jesus. Our fellowship with one another. We are called to encourage and, and, and lift up one another. The ministries that we do and the mission that we have. And I reminded us that day that our diversity is our what? Strength, right? Our diversity is our strength. And then last week, Paul begins call, talking to them about wisdom. Uh, you know, these Corinthians, uh, they sought wisdom and, and those who would speak, you know, very articulately. I, I talked about the, the, the sophists that, that would come or the orator, debater, people that would come and they would want to speak on behalf of the city. And, and whoever spoke the most eloquently would be the one who got the job. But Paul talks to them about the cross. And the cross is not about elo eloquence. The cross is actually, he says, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved with this power and wisdom and strength. Today we're going to continue uh, as we move in from the first chapter, and we're going to do the whole second chapter today, okay? I know some of you are like, whoa, it's a lot, okay? But just trust me, okay? We'll kind of go through it uh, 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 quick. Uh, we continue along the lines of considering this wisdom that is uh, from God, that is God's plan of salvation. This wisdom that might run counterintuitively from the world's wisdom because it involves God dying on the cross. I want to start with a question, though. Let, let, let me ask you, who would you trust with anything and why? Maybe share with the person around you, okay? Just, just take a moment. You can talk. Who would you trust with anything and why? Go. Are y'all worried about the person next to you is going to want you to say them? <laughs> All right. Who would you t share, share with the person by you? Who would you trust with anything and why? Y'all know my answer, don't you? Now, it, I mean, th now, this is a human person, okay? Obviously God, but I'm talking about a human person, okay? Like, a, like, like not the divine being who created everything. Of course we trust God with everything. Gina. Jaina's going to be the one, right? And even if she wasn't the one, I probably needed to say her anyway. But she is definitely, absolutely, 100%. Gina, if you're joining us online, which you probably are, you, she is the one I'm going to trust with anything. And the reason is because she's proved trustworthy. Time and time again, we have been through hard things in life. And over and over again, we have proved trustworthy to one another, loyal to one another, helped each other, been with each other in the pit and encouraged one another. So, of course, I'm going to trust her with anything. So, with that thought in your mind of who you would trust with anything, let's uh, read about Paul and his ministry to the Corinthians. 
He says in verse 1 of chapter 2, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Let me ask you this. Let's say you're going into the, uh, you have a heart problem, you're going to the emergency room, you realize you're going to have to have a surgery, okay? And you have two doctors that they say, you, you can choose from these two doctors, Okay, they're each going to come in and, and they're going to talk to you about the surgery that you're going to have to have. Okay, the first person comes in and they are, I mean, they are dressed to the T. And um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, one time we had to go to a doctor at Duke and at Duke they have like really big knots in their ties. I don't know why, but, and this guy wasn't as nice, but he had a really big knot in his tie. So imagine, I mean, this guy's got a really big knot in his tie, a real fancy tie, okay? And, um, and he comes in and he's so eloquent. And he talks about all the, the, the valves in the heart and all those little, you know, the what are they, veins and blood vessels and, and, and the, 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 you know, the electromagnetic, whatever, you know, because there's some electron, electric stuff happening, right? There's, I know there's something, okay? Obviously, I am not a heart surgeon, okay? But this person comes in, and they do their thing. And then the next guy comes in, and he might be kind of dressed like me. He might have blue jeans on and like a polo shirt and some cowboy boots. And he comes in, and he's like, yeah, we're going to... And he doesn't call it the heart. He's like, we're going to take the thingamajig and the tubes, and we're going to get it all pumping back right. We're going to split you open and put you back together, and we can give you this nice little pillow you get to hold close and cough afterwards. All right. So you might have these two different experiences, but then the hospital tells you the first guy has a 50% strike rate with getting you out of there and living a good life afterwards. But the second guy who called your heart a thingamajig, he's got a 95% rate. Who are you going to go with? Thingamajig man, right? Because there's a demonstration of his skills there. Does that, get you in, does that wrap your mind around what Paul is saying to them here? You know, they're sitting there, they're, they're divided over all of these things. And I don't know much about Apollos and how exactly his ministry was and Peter and his ministry. And, you know, maybe they had a very extensive vocabulary. But Paul reminds them of the experience that he has had with them because faith that moves others will always come, a, come from a demonstration of faith and not words alone. Let me say that again. Faith that moves others will always come from a demonstration of faith and not words alone. You know, I think about Paul and the experiences that he must have had. You know, we're reading these letters where he's crafted them and sent them, and we get this image of Paul that Paul was a perfect person. But we see that he struggles over and over. There's, there's this thorn in the flesh that he has. I wonder if, if, if he had some real conversations with some of the people there. Maybe they saw him not at his best. And he had a, to, to show them what repentance looked like. Maybe there were some people who came in who were very opposed to the message that Paul was sharing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and they witnessed Paul be loving to these people, kind to them and win them over. Because brothers and sisters, it's very, very important for us to practice what we preach. Amen? He says in verse 4 and 5, My message and my preaching. He did preach and he did bring a message, but they were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest, so their faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. This past week I was thinking through this text, and I was thinking about the people who have touched my life the most. And it's not been people with extensive vocabularies. It's been people who were deeply in love with Jesus Christ and pointed me toward Him. They didn't live perfect lives. They didn't have it all together, but they lived lives focused on Jesus Christ. I was reminded of a, of a Cooperative Baptist Fellowship training event that I went to, and there was going to be a worship service that night, and there were breakout sessions during the day. And, and you know, as I love uh, preaching and teaching the Word of God, I went to one of the sessions, and, and my, uh, my old... Uh, a uh, professor from seminary was teaching this. I was excited about reconnecting with him. And he's a, a, wonderful, a, a wonderful man, 
um, and, and I, enjoyed, I, I enjoyed the classes that I took with him. I probably could have made better grades if I had spent a whole lot of time with the vocabulary uh, rather than with the Word of God. Uh, because, and, and again, I, I love this man, but we sat there and for an hour and a half were being trained to speak words in a sermon so that there was alliteration. All, uh, some of the words had the same, you know, uh, the, the, the same structure to them, so they sound pleasing to people's ears. I was told that this man spent three hours on one sentence alone. One sentence alone. And then I sat in that sermon that night and listened to it and had this revelation. At the time, I was struggling with, with, with the exact calling that God had in my life. And, and, and obviously, organization and uh, timeliness and some of those things might be a little bit of a struggle for me. Hence the golf getting in trouble with the golf, you know. It was on the calendar. was one of the, the one of my points of contention that I got in trouble there because it was on one of our calendars. And I was supposed to know all where you know anyway. So I don't want to do. I don't want to get in more trouble this morning. Don't do it, Graham. Um, but I remember being struck with this thought. I could spend a lot of time making the Word of God sound good, but if I don't spend the time living it out in the community, it means nothing. You hear me this morning? It is so important, it is so important that we know Jesus, like know, not know stuff about Jesus, but know Jesus, but spend the time knowing God, spending the time in prayer seeking Him, spending the time in the Scriptures and letting them speak to us and change our lives. We, we, we have a message to share every single day with our community in our places uh, where we work, in our schools. It is so important that we live it out because faith that moves others will always come from a demonstration of the faith and not just the words we speak. Secondly, living bold faith is not easy. If it doesn't scare you, if your vision doesn't scare you, it might not be big enough. In verse 3, he says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Let me tell you this morning that as you try to, to, to live a faith that moves others, that rests on the power of God, God is going to call us into situations where, we have we, where our weaknesses are exposed. The purpose in that is that uh, God's strength is also shown in our weaknesses. Paul says he came with fear and with trembling, but he demonstrated to them the gospel of Jesus through the way he lived. Third, the key to faith that rests on the power of God is a laser focus on Jesus Christ and listening to the Holy Spirit. You see it in verse 2. He says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I imagine Paul in every scenario, in every situation, whatever was happening, he was continuing to worship Jesus, to give thanks to Jesus and for His movement, to, to point people to Jesus and to the gospel that brings salvation. And now we're going to go real quick uh, from verse 6 through 16. And Paul kind of wraps up this, uh, this thought about wisdom with talking about the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's work. He says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we ask, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, ex explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught with spirit words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them 
because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let me ask you one last question. Do you want to know and have the mind of Christ? Do you? I, I think that's hopefully a desire that we, that we all should have. The scriptures teach us, and, and Paul is echoing it here, that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that His Holy Spirit dwells in us. Okay? Sometimes I'm, I'm afraid that people aren't reminded that enough. They come to, to Jesus. They, they want salvation. They don't want to go to hell for eternity. They don't want to live separate from God now. But they don't realize what is available to them. The very Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you if you are in Christ. Think about that for a moment. You might not feel very powerful from time to time. There are moments that I feel so weak. But I have to remind myself the Spirit of God dwells in me. And I can have the mind of Christ if I listen to that Holy Spirit. When I spend the time in the Scriptures, God opens doors for me to share what He teaches me through the Scriptures. I, 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 want, I want to dare you, I want to challenge you to live an anointed life. To live a life of purpose. To live a life that, that when you get to the end of it, that person after person gives testimony of what God has done in their lives because of you. Living a life like that is not easy. Living a life like that will cause much fear, much trembling. It'll expose your weaknesses, but it'll give you the chance to channel God's working through the Holy Spirit that already dwells in you. As we conclude this morning, let me give you one little challenge here. This week, try, try, just try for one week, okay? Try, and, try to spend at least 10 minutes every day in the Bible, okay? Reading it. Now, not just saying, okay, got a timer here, bam, let's go. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ. You know, just, you know, begrudgingly it does not help, right? It's not, I mean, you'll probably get a little bit, but you won't get, you know, you won't get the full effect, okay? Set 10 minutes aside, all right? I mean, you can waste 30 minutes scrolling Instagram or TikTok or, or right like that, right? Youth, y'all know this. Like, I had one youth girl one time. We went on this retreat, and, um, and the next morning she looked bad. I'm like, what happened to you last night? And she said, this was back when Instagram was first getting all the videos and stuff. She said, well, you know on the Instagram where it's got the videos, and you just watch one, and then it goes right to the next one? I did that all night long last night. I'm like, you did what? Like, so, and, and at these camps, they make you go to bed, like, lights off is at 11, and, like, 8 o'clock is when you get up, and so... That's a long time of watching videos, right? Okay? So, I mean, th these, I mean, like Facebook is made to keep our attention and hold it. Give the Lord just 10 minutes. Just 10 minutes. Read the Word of God. Try to understand it. And I promise you, the Holy Spirit will start pointing things out to you. God will start speaking to you through those words. And later in the day, you'll, you'll have... Or it might be the next day, you'll have these moments where something is happening and all of a sudden God reminds you of what He is teaching you. And you have, and He's putting this wisdom, this wisdom that doesn't come from the world, but this wisdom that comes from God, this wisdom that comes from a crucified Savior on a cross that changes you and changes others. Faith that moves others, faith that rests on the power of God, always comes. From a demonstration of the faith. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the divine will you have for each of us, for us corporately as a church. God, I pray this morning that if there is any person who doubts that, that they would spend time in prayer with you, spend time seeking you, spend time in this beautiful word that you have given us, reading and allowing it to change them and, and to challenge them. And, and I pray that we would all find that we have so much value and so much purpose in your kingdom. Lord, I pray this morning that if there are, are some who want to make a profession of faith and, and make it public that they have put faith in Jesus for salvation, that they would come forward to do that.
or maybe to be baptized, or maybe to become members of this church. Lord, I pray that we would all have courage in all the ways that you are leading us and guiding us to take steps, steps of faith. Steps of faith that rest on your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you now to uh, stand and sing hymn number 504, Without Him. Now, I can't imagine us living a life without God. You can go ahead and stand up. I can't, I can't imagine living a life without God. Okay? And some people do that. But we, again, we have, we have a direct channel to the God who created everything. So as we're singing that, this song, let's think about that. And think about the lifeline that Jesus has given us. And again, this morning, if you feel that today's a day that you want to come and make a, a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we're told in the scriptures that when we put faith in Jesus, we're not supposed to hide that under a bushel. We're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. We're supposed to come before the body of Christ and to celebrate that. Amen? We're supposed to shout it out loud and let others know that we, we have put faith in Jesus and we are part of this family. And here at our church, as we do that, you become part of the family. You become a member of the church. So maybe that's where you're at this morning. Or maybe, maybe, maybe it's been a, a long time ago that you made a public profession of faith and you haven't walked into the waters of baptism and you want to come forward and share a desire to do that this morning. I want to invite you to meet me down at the front. Or maybe you want to come. I know this is a short hymn. It's only two. I know this. But, you, but Johnny's good on the organ. He can keep it rolling, okay? If you want to come this morning and, and have a time of prayer, in whatever way you want to come, I invite you to come in the name of Jesus. Again, let us sing hymn number 504 without him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this day of worship. We thank you for the many ways that your Holy Spirit is guiding us and leading us and directing us. And again, we pray that we would have courage to follow you in all the ways uh, you are leading us. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And may you go in peace. Amen.